All right. Um, well, thank you everybody for, for joining today. Why don't we get started? Uh, you all probably know the, the Grow NYC School Gardens team. There's me, Kristen, and then we have Laura and Chantel. But we are really excited to welcome Christian here today. Um, I first met, well, virtually met Christian back in the spring. Um, he is a student at John Bound High School. And the John Bound students had launched a Facebook page where they made these amazing videos. And Christian did a 20 minute tour of his house plants that was like completely captivating. So we've been a fan since we first saw. Um, but like I said, he is a student at John Bound High School. Um, he is an He's in the agriculture program there, and he is an absolute urban ag enthusiast, but he specifically loves houseplants. And in the past year, he's made himself a collection of about 25 um, and growing. So um, if you haven't already seen it, he did a Houseplants for Beginners like 101 session that we're going to share afterwards. Um, it's amazing, and this is Houseplant Ultimate Houseplant Starter Guide for Beginners Part Two. So, Christian's going to lead us through a lot of knowledge. He is open to questions, so if you have questions throughout, please put them in the Q and A or in the chat, and myself, Laura, and Chantel will will make sure that we ask all of your questions your questions to Christian at the very end. Um, okay. And another reminder is that we are recording this, and after the session today, we're going to share out the video with everybody. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Christian, who's going to share all of his houseplants with us today. Yep. Thank you, Kristen. So as Kristen said, my name is Christian Gilsus. I'm an urban agriculturalist, and I'm going to be facilitating this houseplant workshop. And again, all questions can be put in the chat and will be answered at the end of the presentation. Thank you. The objective for, next slide, please. Okay. The, the objective for this webinar is to be able to obtain long-term success with the houseplants that you have gotten from part one of the Ultimate Houseplant Starter Guide for Beginners, as well as the bonus of getting tips on how to have fun with your plants. The first order of business that we are going to discuss is houseplant pests. I'm sure 90% of the people here tonight have dealt with pests on their plants. Pests are pretty common, making it really important that we go over them to make sure that we can handle them when they appear. We don't want to lose all of our plants because we didn't know there was a pest in our plant and we let it take over. The first pest we are going to talk about is spider mites. Spider mites are super common. They grow and multiply really fast, which could be really det detrimental to our plants, but, in but not unless you catch them early. When identifying spider mites, you want to watch out for white dust-like spots and spider webs. If you notice these dots and no spider webs, then you caught them early, which is good. If you blow on the spots lightly and they don't fly off, they are mites. You first want to rinse your plant to get all the mites off, and then you could go in with a cotton swab with a mixture of water and dish soap and just wipe the, uh, the excess spider mites off that, you didn't, that did not get wa washed away the first time. Make sure to leave none behind and wipe all of them away all over the plant. You don't want to leave behind and then they can multiply. If you notice spider webs on your plant, you caught the mites later on. This is why they're called spider mites because of the spider webs they form on your plant. As you can see on your screen, these were my alocasias that got infested with spider mites. If you look closely, you, you could see the little white dots on them and my, my tiny dancer alocasia actually formed, its leaves formed into a cup shape because of, because of the webs the spider mites formed. If you have alocasias, be very careful because spider mites, because they are super spider mite prone. But again, removal of spider mites is fairly easy with, with just rinsing your plant with neem oil um, and insecticidal um, soap. The next pest is thrips. They are super small, as we can see, and they and they actually have a long a long shape to their to their bodies to look out for if you do notice that you have a pest but you can't figure out which pest it is. And when I say thrips are small, I mean they are very small. I say that I say that the key to thrips is catching it in the first place, which could be really difficult because of how small it is. If you see a white du dusty coating on your plant leaves, then you know you have thrips. 
because it is in most cases the most prominent clue. Some other telltale signs are the browning of leaf, of leaf ends as well as brown spots developing on your leaves. Thrips attacks your whole plant. Leaves are not only susceptible. You could see damage on flowers and stems as well. From my experience, thrips is very common on calatheas and should be immediately treated when discovered. Treating thr thrips is fairly easy. You just want to spray the plant with insecticidal soap or neem oil onto your plant and let it sit for three to five minutes to do its thing and kill all the pests. After that, you could wipe your plants thoroughly and be on the lookout for the next five to seven days. You want to make sure that they don't come back. The next pest we're gonna be looking at are mealy bugs. Mealy bugs are super easy to spot and super easy to get rid of. Like these are one of the, the I wouldn't say the best pests to have, but the, the easiest pests to take care of. They are super common amongst all types of plants. You know you have mealy bugs when you see puffy little spots on your, on your plant stems and leaves. If you poke them and they move, then you know you, it's not perlite or dust and it's mealy bugs. Getting rid of them is super easy. All you have to do is take a Q-tip with rubbing alcohol and swipe them off your plant. If you have the heavy infestation like the picture on the bottom left, you could spray your plant with neem oil and insecticidal soap, wait five minutes and thoroughly wipe all the mealy bugs away. It's that simple. The next pest we have and the last pest is fungus gnats. In my last webinar, if you attended that one, a lot of people were having issues with fungus gnats. So I knew I had to include them in this webinar. Once you get fungus gnats, is it's as if you can never get rid of them. This means that you want to make sure that, that you always make sure to prevent the start of fungus gnats. You know when you have fungus gnats, when you see little flies that look similar to fruit flies, um, and they, they always congregate around your plants and around the soil. Get a ring of, getting rid of fungus gnats is fairly simple. You, you could put sticky traps on the soil to catch all the flies that fly around your, pet, uh, your plant. Or you could put down mulch on your soil because fungus gnats start appearing because your soil is always constantly moist and the humidity is really high. That's why I always encourage not overwatering and not having such high humidity for long periods of time. So mulch on your soil will prevent these, um, these flies from breeding and multiply. And of course, you could spray your plant with insecticidal soap and neem oil if you do not have mulch or sticky traps. If none of these work, which is possible, you could do a complete soil change and repot your plants. When you do this, you want to make sure to get rid of all of the soil and replace it with fresh soil. After the complete soil change, you could do a soil drench, which, which is just hydrogen, is drenching your soil in hydrogen peroxide to kill any lingering eggs that you might have missed because you don't want another infestation. So we went through a lot of pests and a lot of facts to remember, but to sum it up, how can we conquer pests? The most important question. The first step to remember when dealing with pests is to be involved with your plants. Always checking your plant leaves and stems can ensure that you can do the steps below. We need to catch pests early in order to administer a variety of, of pest control methods to ensure that we get the pest problem under control while making sure that the pest control method is adequate. You don't want to use a method that doesn't work. With these three simple steps, you won't have to worry about pests when and if you get them. How you water your plant and the amount of sunlight you give determines how happy your plant is going to be. A lot of people had questions in my last webinar about correct watering and sunlight, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through, through it. Watering seems simple, but, but can determine whether your plant dies early or lives a, a long, healthy life. The three key steps to remember when watering your plant are on your screen right now. If you follow these steps, your plant will not die. The first thing you want to do is make a schedule or know when your plant needs water. This requires you knowing your plant or at least doing a little research on the internet of, of what other gardeners experience were like with that plant in terms of watering. You want to know when your plant dries out and how long it takes for your plant to dry out. Knowing this can help you make a schedule, which is really important. Right? Um, for example, Apothos likes damp soil all the time. It doesn't like when you let, let its soil dry out. Keeping this in mind, I would observe how long it takes my Apothos to dry out 
And after I thoroughly water, and I can now use this information to know when to water my plant next. The next step is to know how, how to water your plant in the, first, in the second place. You, you, you might be wondering, Christian, are you serious? I know how to pour water over my plant. Watering actually gets deeper than this. A ficus might not want to get watered in a saucer like your African violet. You need to know what watering method your plant needs. Watering Af African violets from overhead actually causes their leaves to rot. This goes with most of the plants that have fuzzy leaves. A ficus might, um, might want to be watered overhead because it might have a bigger pot, because they grow larger, and because they have a woody stem. So it doesn't affect its leaves if you pour water overhead. Another thing is to never water your plants with ice cubes. Th this is a good idea. This is never a good idea, despite what most garden centers suggest, um, for example, for your orchid. Ice cubes can shock your plant and lead them to die. Again, it's all about knowing your plant. The final step is to simply stop overwatering. How do you stop overwatering, you ask? Well, it's easy. When you water, you want to let your plant fully drain all the excess water out. This is the reason why you need to have your plants in pots that have drainage holes and not that have no drainage holes. Also, if your plant never has a little period where its soil gets slightly dry out, slightly dried out a little, then you know you're overwatering. Your plant could also have, could also give you signs that you're overwatering, like, like when the bottom leaves start yellowing or rotting, a key sign that you're overwatering. The plant leaves could also start getting little brown spots all over the leaves. This means that the cells in, of your plant are actually exploding and dying. Using these simple steps, you can now water your plant the right way in order to have a happy plant for a long time. Sunlight is a key factor in plant growth, so we want to get it right so our plants grow big and strong. Your fir you first could take some time to experiment with your plant. If you had your plant in one spot and you didn't see any growth, then you know you need to find a new spot for it. Just like watering, you want to know your plant. Does your plant like bright and direct light or does it like low light situations? You also want to find out where, you, where, you, where the light you are providing is coming from. Is the window that you have your plants in front of a south facing window or a west facing window? Well, to break it down, south facing windows have the strongest light and are the best for light loving plants. North facing windows have the weakest light but provide consistent light throughout the day. This light would be good for low, for low light loving plants like Santavarias. East facing light provides medium to low light, which is good, which is a good in between and can be adequate for a wide variety of plants. Lastly, west facing windows provide the best facing the the best facing light because it is not as strong as south facing light, but it is stronger than east facing light. Sounds a little complicated, but once you get it figured out, super easy. Finding which direction your window faces is super easy and could be done with a compass app on your phone, in case you were wondering. Once you find which light is best for your plant, you want to make sure you're always you always provide indirect light unless plants need say otherwise, because scorching could happen. Your plant's leaves will get sunburnt and will either turn white or will turn brown and crispy. This damage is irreversible and needs to be cut off your plant, which you don't want. Indirect light is simply light that is not coming straight from the sun. Any sun rays that hit your plant directly is direct light. You could fix direct light with a sheer curtain or moving your plant to a different location like further back in the room or to the side. Your plant will give you one main sign you are giving it too little light. When, and that's how you know you're dealing with a really low light situation when you need a high light situation. Your plant will stretch out and become leggy. Succulents and many other plants will stretch themselves out to point to the nearest light source. This could lead to an unattractive appearance. Vine plants will also become leggy and have large spaces in between each leaf on their vines, which is what leggy means. This is simply fixed by moving your plant closer to a light source. It's always important to make the most of your plants and have fun with them. There are certain things that you can do to make them even more happy while making you happy and motivate you to increase that houseplant collection. 
These two activities could also be done on a rainy day or simply just to zest up your houseplant game. The first activity we could do is making, making some do-it-yourself fertilizers at home to help your houseplants grow. When I say DIY, I mean easy but effective hacks for your houseplants. You could take some of your kitchen scraps and put them to good use. Banana peels could be used to provide potassium for your plants. Potassium helps with healthy growth of, of your plant. Eggshells can provide calcium for your plant. And calcium, like humans, helps the plant stay strong and healthy. But before adding those to the soil, you want to make sure to rinse the eggshells and crush them into a powder. You probably didn't know that cooking water could also be used for your plants. After you steam your vegetables, you could, you could use the water for your plants because of, of all the vitamins it has in it. Vegetables lose most of their nutrients after you steam or boil them. That means that all those nutrients are picked up in the water. You wouldn't want to waste valuable nutri nutrition that could be used for your plants. Lastly, we have coffee grounds, which can add acidity to your soil. Some plants require more acidic soil. Over time, your soil loses its acidity because of constant watering. Coffee grounds should only be given to plants that like acidity, like jade plants, African violets, and Christmas cactus. You can add the coffee grounds onto the soil and cover it with a layer of soil to ensure that it breaks down properly. You want to do the same with banana peels and eggshells. Just put them under a layer of soil to prevent pests and odor. There you have it, a simple way to add nutrients to your plant's soil from materials you already have at home. Propagation is, is one of my favorite things to do with my plants. The best thing is, is that you can make more plants. Who doesn't want more plants? You could propagate your plants using a leaf, stem, or a pup. Propagation keeps, keeps, helps keep your plant nice and neat because you are removing long, unruly vines and making your plant look fuller. If your plant is unfortunately on its last legs because you overwatered or scorched it, its leaves will actually don't fret because you could still save it. You could take a cutting and propagate it to start over. You don't want to do this if your plant has pests. I'm actually gonna do a live, propag a live propagation demonstration for you guys today. I have a Maranta right here or a prayer plant, a Brazil philodendron under here and my Christmas cactus right over here, as well as my pearls and jade pothos, which I will show later, that I'm going to be taking cuttings in front of so you guys could have a live demonstration to see what you could do at home. But before that, if anybody has questions after this webinar, you could ask me to feel and feel free to contact me on Instagram or Facebook at Klaikamumu. And I also have this webinar in a similar blog form that goes over the over similar things that we went over today in case you wanted to refer back on klaklakmumu.com. Okay, so now let's get to the live propagation demonstration. Uh, Christian, I'm gonna stop screen sharing so that um, people can see it more full screen when, when you do your demo. Yes, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna start with my prayer plant right here. I I've, I've saw that in the chat that somebody's favorite plant was, was this one, so I have one here today. So I mentioned on my slide presentation, you want to look for nodes, leaves, or stems. So this one, you could actually use nodes or stems. You don't want to use leaves because they won't grow as well, or it'll take a super long time, which is not fun. <laughs> so as you, as you can see here, I'm going to pull it up close. Let me pull this leaf back. Just bear with me here. Okay. If you see here, we have a node right here, which is that little bulbous part of the stem and then you have the actual stem right here so first you want to take your shears you want to disinfect them always important to disinfect so you don't transfer any pests it's going to quickly disinfect here take my shears just going to disinfect with an alcohol pad really quick just to ensure that i'm not transferring any pests or anything and then i'll make the cut Huh? Excuse can me? people use scissors for this as well if they don't yes, have yeah. So you could use regular regular scissors as well. It doesn't have to be shears. Just make sure to disinfect as well Okay. Um, in between cuttings. 
So here, as I was showing, we have the leaf right up here, the stem, we have the bulbous part of the stem and you just wanna cut right under to give it space um, to grow roots. Let me see here, which one I was showing. <laughs> yeah, right here. Okay, so I would just cut right in between, right under there, right there is perfect. And there, let me show you what I cut. As you see here, so here's where the roots are gonna come out, right in this, let me put this down real quick, in this little bulbous part. And then this was just extra, so I make sure that I didn't cut in between the node and then ruin the whole cutting. And you could just take a cup, um, fill this with water and just put it in here. And then there you got your first cutting. Okay, so now moving on to more viney plants, like this one right here like my pearls and jade pothos. So I have, as you can see, very long, very unruly. So I have a lot to cut here, but just to demonstrate. So I'm gonna take this big long vine, just put you in close. You could see these little nubs that are sticking out of the stem. Those are called aerial roots. And that's what's gonna grow like the big large roots that you're gonna see in the soil. So you could actually cut it in the same thing as a node, you don't want to cut in between those aerial roots. Let me show you better right over here, right there. You don't want to cut in the middle of that. You want to cut slightly under on the stem. So I would disinfect my, my shears real quick and then make the cut. So we see here, I would cut in between right here. Done, simple as that. And then I have this whole vine. But if I want more propagations than just this, I could actually cut each individual leaf because if you notice, there's area roots for each, each leaf. So there's area roots here, area roots here, and aerial roots right here. So I could actually make a whole bunch of cuttings that I could show you guys right now. So I would cut again on the stem. That's one. Another one right there. And then another one right there. And then I have four cuttings. So I have this little vine part, which I could stick in soil because um, in water, because there's area roots right here. And then four cuttings in total, three other ones of just leaves that I could stick in water and just use later when they grow roots. And then I have my Christmas cactus. So this one is super easy because each one of these segments as you can see, um, this plant has little segments to it. So I could actually just, it's just super easy. They, they come apart really easy. So you, I could actually propagate each one of these stems as you can see here. This is like a big segment with many little stems. So I could tear off each one of these stems where it connects to the main stem and propagate each that. Or if I wanna go further, I could take each one of these little segments that you see here and propagate each one of those to have individual plants. So I, I, I'll actually do both demonstrations. So I would just take it right here, just that simple. It was that easy. And then I, would, I could just stick this in a combination of sandy soil or water and it'll grow roots. Um, but if I wanna go further, like I said, I could, this little piece right here, could just bend it and twist it a little. And there, I could propagate this and make a whole new plant just out of this leaf alone. And then lastly, I have another viney plant for you guys to see, which is my heart leaf philodendron. Again, really long, long vines. Okay, so this one, as you can see here, this part got a little leggy compared to the rest of it, which is really bushy. So I, I could cut this off and have the rest of it uh, as a bushy plant and then propagate this. So it, I can make this a really nice plant like this. So I could, um, just the same thing that we did with the pearls and jade pothos. We have each individual leaf has aerial roots, which you can't see, but they're there. Um, so I could propagate this leaf, for example and just cut right up, disinfect your shears first. <laughs> okay. 
and then take your stem, your vine, go to the leaf. Remember that the aerial nodes, the aerial roots are right under it. So you don't want to cut right in the middle of this of this leaf. You want to cut a little bit under it. So you want to just come in right here, snip it, and then you're done. And then you could do, you could actually cut this this leaf again right um right after a little right there and now I could use this this leaf to grow roots in water and have a whole new plant like that and I could also put this in water over here so I could cut this off because there's this part of the stem off because there's no nodes like here's a node right here you could see a node there's a little line and that's where the roots are going to come out cut a little uh all this stem out and now roots are going to grow from here and I could have a whole new vine just off of this. So that was my propagation demonstration for you guys. I hope it's useful that you guys can do it at, at home and make so many more plants out of the plants that you already have because who doesn't want more plants? I know I always want more plants and now you guys could do it at home. Um, this is awesome, Christian. I feel like we just watched you expand your house plant collection to like 10 more from what you've already <laughs> Yes, I have a lot, a lot of new cuttings. <laughs> um, I wish we could we have the cuttings to all the attendees today. I, I feel know. like there's enough around. <laughs> um, we have a yeah. good number of questions coming in for you. So you maybe we'll start with the, the cuttings like questions. <laughs> um, the first is... Somebody's wondering if you're going to put all those pothos cuttings in this in one cup, or are you going to put them in different cups? You you can actually put them in, in different cups, um, but, but since they came from the same plant that I know doesn't have pests, then I would I'm going to put them in the same cup. And also, I didn't mention it before. You could actually put your um, I don't know if it, it'll answer any questions, but you could actually put the cuttings that you just took in water in soil that you keep really moist in sphagnum moss or in perlite. Nice. Um, another question was, uh, where do the pests come from if you're not like introducing new plants into your home, right? So I don't have any new plants. So how did I get spider mites? Yeah. So actually, when you bring plants home, you might not notice it. Some plants actually are very susceptible to, to pests. Like, for example, during Christmas or the holidays, poinsettias. You might have poinsettias in your home from the garden center. I actually brought a poinsettia from the garden center and I didn't even know it had um, mealybugs on it, but poinsettias are really susceptible to, to mealybugs. So you might not even know that they're super small and actually spores or tiny, tiny uh, microscopic versions of the, of the pests um, will later grow up into the larger pests that you could actually see in your home. And then that's when you realize Oh, I have I had pests this whole time. Like fungus gnats actually lay eggs in the soil, um, which is why they're always around the soil. And you might pick that plant up from the garden center and look at it. Oh, there's no fungus gnats. There's no mealybugs. There's nothing. And then when you bring it home and you see all these fungus gnats, you're like, where did they come from? Um, usually from from eggs or tiny little spores, and or just little baby versions of the bigger pest. I've, I've heard once in a while, I don't know if this is like a conspiracy theory, but that they can actually be in bags of soil because they can stay dormant for so long, certain types of pests. Um, and usually potting soil is pretty clean, but you might just be like that one in a hundred bag that just got unlucky. Um, so another question we got is uh, someone who lives in upstate New York recently bought some air plants from Florida and put them in the living room window. Will they live inside until spring? That's her question. I'll also add on, sh should they stay inside or can you bring them outside? Yes, um, I could actually ask um, what, what plant was it again? Uh, air plants. Yes, okay. So air plants, um, they, they will live in, in the windowsill, in front of the windowsill. Just make sure that you don't put them too close so they don't get too cold. Because remember, air plants are tropical plants. They like high humidity. And if you keep them in front of, a, um, I don't know, I don't know if you mentioned if you live in New York or anywhere where there's winter time. In the winter time, it's really dry and air plants die fast that way. So if you keep them in front of a windowsill, really dry conditions um, that the air plants do not like. So keep them in like far farther away from a windowsill, um, provide high humidity and a little bit of warmth and they'll live fine all the way until spring. 
Nice. Um, another question is uh, from Angela. She said, my English ivy plant is leggy. How do I make them bushier? Is that possible? Yes. It, it, it is. So you actually want to provide as much light as possible. English ivies and all vine um, plants are super easy to get leggy. So um, as I said earlier in the webinar, um, you want to check what window cell your, your light is coming from, if it's south or north. Um, if it's you want to give it a south, if you if it's possible in your in your house, then you could move it to a south facing window because it has the strongest light to make it really bushy. Um, I would recommend I, I would recommend um, cutting all the leggy parts off and propagating those to hopefully start over and um, from the beginning. Um, but if you don't want to do that, then then just provide as much light as possible. All right, we have a question from a school gardener who has a school greenhouse that often has problem with root gnats. So I'm not sure exactly what that is actually, but how can um, they prevent this besides trying not to overwater? Yes, so you could actually um, neem oil um, and other organic ways to, to, if your garden is organic, um, if it is for food, then you want to choose the organic path, then you could still spray neem oil, it's still possible. Um, but yeah, I would just recommend neem oil and try also, that out and see if it works. You mentioned hydrogen peroxide earlier yes. too, and that might work well because it's in the roots. Mm -hmm. um, so that could also be something to try is like a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and water. Yes. Okay, another question um, is from someone, uh, Tammy. She says she has horrible luck with plants and her cactus almost died how did she save it? She's not sure what she did wrong. Yes, so um, a common misconception is that succulents and cacti are super easy plants and the best beginner plant. Um, I actually went over it in my part one of the Ultimate Houseplant Starter Guide for Beginners. Um, that that is a myth. You don't want to if you're if you don't have a houseplant yet and you're looking you're researching into it, then you do not want to start with a succulent or cactus because they're going to die fast. It's super easy. You need to, it takes a lot of um, adjusting and experimenting to, with light situations and watering um, in order to get that perfect mixture and then them thriving. Um, but succulents and cacti need really full sun, full sun, full indirect light. Um, and it's it depends because you could water a cactus once a month and then a whole month without watering. Um, but other cactus need possibly maybe once every two weeks, just experiment with it. All right, we've got a question about spider mites. Um, is it possible for spider mites to ever leave the plants and spread to household furniture? Um, actually, it, it, it is for a short period of time, but without the plant, they will not survive. So they're not gonna stay on forever. Um, you might just brush one off and then it'll die after that because it doesn't have a plant. Um, but actually transferring onto other surfaces is, is common. Like for example, I have an indoor greenhouse. So if I had a huge infestation with spider mites, I could possibly be taking them out and then brush one off onto like the side of, of, of my greenhouse. And then I would move another plant into that space that didn't have spider mites. And then it would brush off from the side of the greenhouse onto my plant. And that's how you could spread pests. So just make sure that um, that piece of furniture that you might um, that you might think that has spider mites on it for a short period of time, that you're not um, moving other plants that do not have spider mites from there and touching that surface. We have a question that I really, I kind of love that came from the chat. Um, Erica wants to know the best plants to keep in your bathroom. So maybe yes. low light, a lot of humidity because you've got the shower going. So. Mm -hmm. What plants are good for the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually pothos, um, like the regular marble queen pothos is great for bathrooms because they, they like low light situations um, and high humidity makes them thrive. Like they just take off with high humidity. And also Sansevierias, very low light. Um, they, they don't need humidity, um, but they, they do appreciate it and they, they're just great. It's like you, you really, really low care for sense of areas that are perfect for bathroom settings. Nice. Um, and then we have a question from Carly and she asks, um, can you propagate any plant? Just, just um, any yes, plant. Yeah. 
That's such a you, big question. <laughs> um, there's a, a huge, huge variety of plants that you can propagate. Um, I would say air plants. You have to wait in order for air plants to put off a pup in order to propagate them. So you can't cut off a leaf and then propagate it from there. You need to wait for, for them to do it. Um, but that's the only plant that I could really think of now because there's a whole bunch of bulb plants um, that you could propagate by just splitting bulbs or taking leaves still. Um, so yeah, I would just right now off the top of my head is air plants. Very cool. Um, so someone had a question here, Irving, and I actually had a similar question too. Um, how safe is it to just change the soil? Um, so I'm, I'm guessing you don't just want to take the stem and rip it out of there. Um, mm -hmm. So what would be your method for safely changing out the soil? Yes. So if you have your plant in a nursery pot, then you would just squeeze the pot. Actually, I could show you right now. You could squeeze the pot just like this, squeeze it, and then gently lift your plant out, gently. And if it's very root bound, then I would just say lots of squeezing over and over until you get it. Like don't rip your plant out because you might um, ruin the roots and then that could lead your plant to die because of shock. Um, and also um, if you have your plant in a terracotta pot, then I would say slowly, slowly try and and, um, and take it out. Um, so if, if your plant is not, or does not have a well-developed root um, system, then it shouldn't be hard because your plant is, isn't stuck to like the sides or anything in a terracotta pot. So it should be easy just to lift them up slowly um, and just dig around the sides to do it. So just be careful when you're soil changing. Okay, uh, we had another question in the chat and they were asking about the container. So say my plant is doing really well, how do I know when I need to change the container? Yes. So you want to, you, you know, when you need to change your containers, when you have, when the, the roots are really root bound, which means that the roots are starting to go in circles. You don't want your, your roots to go in circles. So then it could actually restrict your plant um, on the inside from getting water. So you, you want to just, you, you want to look at your plant's roots. You, you could just gently, so when your plant is kind of on the drier side and sl slightly dry, it's easy to just pop them off of the pot and just observe the root and of the roots. And that's why I always say to, it's important to be involved with your plant. You want to know, um, but some plants like Hoyas actually, fun fact, they actually like to be root bound. So just do a quick research of your plant, um, make sure that, that they actually like that. Um, and then, and then, you know, yeah, because because some plants actually die really quick when they're when they're root bound. So, I recently had to deal with that. I noticed that my um, I think it was my rosemary plant. Whenever I watered it, the water would go straight through, like it wasn't hitting any soil, um, and then it would dry out super fast, like within a day. And yeah. So that's how I knew that inside the pot was mostly roots. There were like more roots than soil. So that's an extreme case. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, speaking of the, the roots and underwatering and overwatering, how can I help my snake plant recover from overwatering? And that might be interesting, um, you know, to hear about that and a root rot and what to do in that situation. Yes, so it depends on how your, how your snake plant is actually doing. If it has just brown tips or a little a little bit of brown spots, then you could just stop watering for two weeks and let it recover that way. If it's if it's like on its on its last legs already and you this is this is your last chance to save it, then do a complete soil change. Um, take out all that soggy wet soil, replace it with dry soil, and hopefully that'll do something. Um, but again, if I said if you want to save your plant, um, if it's super super bad a bad situation, then you could take cuttings, just cut a whole leaf off um, and stick it in wet soil and really wet soil and it'll grow a new, new snake plant. Christian, how about music? We have a question about do certain types of music helps plants grow? <laughs> yeah, I actually saw that in the chat earlier. Um, I'm, not, I'm not positive on the science behind music, but I actually have seen um, research on that music actually does help your plants grow. So that is a fact. Um, but I'm not sure on what types. I would have to do more research on that. 
Yeah, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say classical R and B hip hop. Um, you know, just, um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the beginners, right? So we know cacti mm -hmm. and succulents not a great plant for a beginner. What would you recommend for somebody who's trying to start out with a house plant? Yes. Um, so I went through a, a list of 10 house plants in my last webinar, um, but just to um, to rerun through it, my Hartley philodendron that I showed propagations of, I'll actually pick up right here. This is like the easiest plant ever to, to take care of. It just, if you, all you need to give it is light. And I started from like a super small four inch pot into this massive plant in only a year. And it's grown all of this for me. So it's a super easy um, plant that doesn't need a lot of care, a lot of intense light. Um, then of course, the ZZ plant over here. I recently got this one, it's growing a new shoe. Um, really, it doesn't need a lot of light. It doesn't need a lot of water, a super great plant. And then lastly, um, my favorite plant species is the Peperomia. I love Peperomias because they're so easy. They come in a huge variety of species. You, you could get super easy species and then once you're more advanced and you have a lot of experience under your belt, then you could move on to more advanced peperomias. So I actually have one right next to me right here. The parallel peperomia. Also, I've had it for only a year and it's grown so big from only a small cutting and super easy to propagate the nodes right here. You could just break it off and put it in water and it'll grow. So I would recommend all types of peperomias like the string of turtles that was mentioned earlier. Also a great beginner plant. Awesome. I also have to say, Chantel, I want your um, plant growing classical hip hop playlist. <laughs> Sounds very interesting. Um, so someone had a question while you're going off on your plant list of a couple of plants that require very little or infrequent watering because they're, they want to grow in a place that's kind of, they have to get in a step ladder. It's a whole deal to get up there. So I guess infrequent water. Yes. So Hoyas actually, because they have succulent like leaves. I have my Hoyas vines right over here. Um, so this is the Crimson Queen. I'll actually pick it up for you to show you the excellent variegation on it. So we see here whole white leaves. Um, so this has a succulent like thicker leaf. So that means that it could go longer periods of time in between watering. Um, and it'll actually show you when it needs watering. Cause if you pick up the leaf right now, this one is, I just watered it. So you see a very smooth leaf, but if it was underwatered and it was at, it was pretty thirsty, then it would, it would have wrinkles under here. It would be wrinkly and you could just feel it. The, the leaf will squish. So that's how you know when you need to water a Hoya. And also um, I would say, Oh, a Sansevieria, a snake plant, super easy. They also have really thick leaves, so they retain lots of water. They are like indestructible, in my opinion, the best for low, low water, low light, and Hoyas, like they like high, high light. So that's the only thing that doesn't make them a, like a super, super beginner plant. Um, but in terms of watering, great. Awesome. Snake plant handy. Someone's asking to see a snake plant. Yes. Um, and while you're looking for one, I can vouch for the fact that they will grow anywhere because before I worked at Grow NYC, I used to work at the Transit Museum, which is a decommissioned subway station with no windows. And we all had snake plants on our desk that grew even without <laughs> any natural light at all. So that's like an excellent one if you have very poor light. Yeah. So this is my snake plant right here. Um, th this one is actually a really slow growing snake plant that I didn't realize was so slow growing. So it actually grew these two leaves. Um, actually, in the past year, it took them <laughs> to grow these two leaves. Um, so, so this one's kind of like a more um, advanced Santaveria, but you could actually get um, super beginner ones, like super, there's, there's ones that you could find anywhere at Home Depot, Garden Center, or your local nursery that you could take care of. But yeah. This is my sense of area right here. Um, I'll also vouch for how easy snake plants are to grow because my someone gave my parents a snake plant when my sister was born and like 28 years later, it's still alive. Wow. Um, and they don't take care of it that well. <laughs> Someone's also asking, what do you do when your snake plant gets really long and tall? Like, how do you care for it then? 
Um, it's actually the same. You, you still want to water it um, regular, regular sunlight. Um, there's no really, there's no real difference. If you don't like it um, that long, then you could just take cuttings of it. Um, maybe give them to your friends, make more. Um, but yeah, you, so you could either take cuttings and cut it short or just leave it like that because there's nothing wrong with it. Um, there is a question in the chat about money trees. Um, Irving, he said, uh, uh, each day the leaves are falling off. It would be nice if they were real money. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> yes, um, money trees are actually very common to give as gifts um, or just you wanna, you wanna pick one up at the local gardens, um, garden center. They're actually kind of finicky. They're really finicky to take care of and not the best beginner house plant. Um, so you're probably overwatering. Um, you want to you want to check on that, um, or maybe possibly underwatering because they do have a trunk, a very thick trunk. So that means that they can that they don't need watering um, that often. So you could actually go very long without watering a money tree because of that thick trunk and how much water it retains. So you're probably overwatering, and that's very very common with money trees, and probably why all the leaves are falling off. We're getting a lot of money tree questions. Um, somebody wants to know if they should leave it in water or put it in soil? I guess they're talking about a clipping. A clipping on a money tree? Uh, yes. Yes, okay, so, so, you, so you could do both. You could actually um, put it in soil, but you wanna make sure that the soil is constantly, constantly overwatered actually, because that's the best um, environment for cuttings. So you want to always keep that soil mo moist and if it dries out, then your roots, your developing roots are gonna dry out and then that cutting is no longer viable. Um, and you could also put it in water. Just make sure to change the water out um, often. All right, I don't think we asked this question yet. Um, can you put all of the pothos cuttings in one cup of water or do you have to separate them out? Yes, so you, so you can actually put them in the same cup if they come from the same plant. If you're taking cuttings from different plants, I do suggest to put them in different cups just to make sure that you're not transferring anything um, and starting off your cuttings in a bad state because you gave them a pest or something. I'm not sure if we asked this one yet, but I'm just saying it now. We've got a question about the best way to care for amaryllis bulbs after they've bloomed. Yes, um, that's actually a really great question. I actually have three amaryllis bulbs right next to me, um, but you just want to take them out of the, you want to wait until your flowers are fully, fully done blooming and your stalks fully dry out and they're done. Then you could just snip it off, snip off, snip off the, the, the stalk, and then the leaves will most likely be done as well. So you could snip them off as well. And then you want to take it out of the soil and let it, let it just dry out. Um, and then you want to put it into, into like a box, a really dark space um, that's nice and cool, not, not damp, a dry, cool place um, that's also dark. And you could just store it for next year. Um, so this is actually another question I kind of had myself uh, from Jackie. Do you recommend any particular indoor grow lamps or grow lights? My window does not supply adequate sunlight for my plants to thrive. So Christian, I don't know if you use any grow lights in your house or maybe at, at the school. I know I tried to get grow lights early on in the pandemic when I went through my house plant phase. And uh, I got like the ones that were cheapest as I could find around $30 and they didn't do much for me. Yes, yeah, so I actually do not use um, grow lights because um, my balcony faces south. Um, so I have super, super strong um, light that's really intense. But I know that Gardener Supply um, has that burpee gardening as well has grow lights that you could check out. Um, but always remember the, the reason why your, your grow lights didn't work is probably because you weren't using the correct bulb. Um, you always wanna remember that plants do not absorb green light, um, but also absorb all other types of light. So you want to make sure that you have lights that um, have strong blue rays, cause that's the light that they most absorb. So you wanna make sure that you're getting the correct bulb um, for the correct base and then putting them. And also something that's um, very um, kind of not understood, I guess, is that, it, because just because you have your um, grow light over your plant, um, you, you need to make sure to keep it close to your plant. Um, if you have your, your, your grow light very far away from your plant, your, light, your, um, your plant isn't actually using the light because it's too far away. 
So you want to have your grow light fairly close to your plant in order for it to um, use the light um, in the most possible way. Yeah, that's great advice. And um, you'll be able to note, like I had to experiment too with how far away it was from the plants because if it was yeah. too far, they would get leggy again. Mm -hmm. And if it was too close, they can get scorched. Yes. So those are just signs to watch out for and you might have to experiment. My other, uh, what I learned is that since I got kind of like a low quality grow light, um, I needed to have it by a window, like with a supplemental light. I couldn't just leave it in like a dark corner of my room. I had to do the grow light plus the window light. So yeah. that's another tip from my past failure. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a perfect transition because one of the next questions that came in is about how do you fix a sun scorched plant? So yes. you scorched it, how do you fix it? <laughs> <laughs> so you actually cannot fix it. Um, once you sun scorch your plants, um, those leaves are done, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so you just want to cut those leaves off. If unfortunately then um, the, your whole plant got sun scorched, you could possibly cut them, cut them all off and cut all like leave three leaves on the base of your plant. And hopefully it, the, your plant will like that part of the leaf will produce as much food as it can for the plant in order to grow a whole new set of leaves. Um, but if it's just the tips or a couple spots, then it'll be okay. Your plant will still keep growing. And then once your plant grows bigger and more leaves that covers those other sunburnt leaves, and you could just cut them off. Awesome. And before we go to the next question, someone asked, what does it mean for it to be scorched? And so can you explain how you'll be able to tell if your plants are scorched? Yes. So, you, so it's like your plant gets sunburned, just, just like you, just like humans. Um, so if your plant has too much sunlight or direct sunlight, like I talked about in the webinar, when, where, the, where the light is directly hitting the leaves of the plant, then, you're, then it's gonna burn your leaves if it's too hot, too, too much light at once. So you're actually gonna see crisping of the leaves. Um, my Maranta, my prayer plant over here actually got sunburned, um, the ends of the leaves and like the ends of the leaves just burnt, like they were crispy, like super crispy and brown all the way like to the middle of the leaf. And, and that's how you know. So it's either really dark, um, crispy, dry, like dry as can be leaves then. And, and you know that you're, that it's the light and it's not any overwatering or underwatering then, then, and if you know it's, it's scorching and you see those common signs of the brown crispy leaves, then you know that it's scorching. Right. Um, oh, we have one more that just came in. My peace lily has dead black leaves and leaves with black edges. Why? Why did this happen to their peace lily? Possibly overwatering, or you have a fungus issue. So peace lilies, since they love water, um, it's it's kind of hard to overwater them. Um, but all that excess water could actually lead to fungus development on leaves. Um, so like black spots or black edges are a common sign of fungus so you want to check that out um, if you see like white fuzzy stuff on the soil or maybe like white tiny spots that you didn't notice or brown spots even um, on the leaves that you didn't notice on the underside or on the top um, then you want to check for fungus and treat it accordingly um, and if it's if, it, if your leaves are black then you could just go ahead and cut those off and let your plant keep growing and just experiment with the water and hopefully lower it and see if that works Um, I think this will be the last question. Oh, this person asked this question uh, before too. So how do I take care of the silvia plant? How do I make it flower? The, what, what plant was it? Uh, Sylvia or Clivia. I don't know how to pronounce this. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, um, I actually, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that plant. Um, I, I don't know if you could put it in the chat, but it, is it, I think it's kind of like a African violet kind of plant. I think I know what you're talking about. With I've like never those, heard of that one either. I, I think I know what you're talking about. And if it's correct, then um, then it's like the same thing as as any African violets or any other plants. You just want to give, yes. give adequate watering and adequate sunlight. And yeah, that that's all. Yep, Christian, you were right. It's a flowering plant native to Southern Africa. Common names, natal lily or bush lily. So yeah, 
yeah so so just make sure to water like treat it the same as an african violet water from a saucer underneath the plant um and and leave it there for a couple hours to absorb that light make sure you thoroughly water um and make sure not to overwater as well christian i'm always so impressed by how much you know about house plants like <laughs> and you're you. getting a whole lot of love in the chat i hope you'll get to like spy in there um yeah, I would love to just read out one comment that uh, Jackie left for you. It's It was great to learn how easy and inexpensive it is to expand my indoor garden. Thank you for the demonstrations. Um, and I think that's <laughs> awesome because you don't have to go out to a nursery and buy all these plants that are three years old. You really showed how you can turn a few plants into a forest in your own house. Yep. So that was really awesome. Yes, and so... Um, we are going to post this recording of the session after it'll be on growNYCdistancelearning.org and it'll also be on Christian's website. And if you're not already following him on Instagram, he has the best Instagram handle in the world. It's cluck cluck moo moo. <laughs> um, and you can follow Christian's plant journey there. Um, I just want to remind everyone, Christian is in high school. He's in the ag program at John Bound High School. So he has already establishing himself as like an urban ag indoor plant expert and he's not even graduated yet which is so awesome so um definitely throw him some love and thanks in the chat we'll make sure that he sees it and um christian thank you so much you know we're we're so happy to have you for part two of the ultimate houseplant beginner's guide <laughs> and hopefully there will be many many more um workshops in the future but thank you so much for joining us today and, and uh, um, I put those links in the um, yes. chat as well. So I put growNYCdistancelearning.org and cluckcluckmoomoo.com. Right, Christian? Okay. Yep, yep. Um, yes, he has a website also, too. <laughs> yeah, so you can visit both those websites. Um, and so we'll be sending you an email with the recording. We have our next uh, workshop is, I believe it's next Wednesday, same time. Um, you can find the info for that in the follow-up email as well, grant writing. Um, we're going to be going over the Grow NYC mini grant that K through 12 public and charter schools in New York City can apply for with us for school gardens and outdoor learning spaces. So just if you, you'll be getting all this info, I'm saying it now really quick, just so you have a heads up. Yes. And we've got one more like nice thing to leave off of the best house plant presentation I have ever attended. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. <laughs> Thank everybody for the support. It was um, my pleasure to be here teaching all of you guys. I always love to spread the house plant love and joy. Awesome. awesome. Yes. Well, thank you, Christian. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in today. And you will have all of this workshop and more in your inboxes a little bit later tonight. So thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you everybody Bye. for coming. <laughs>